I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Sometimes it takes a different approach to help you unlock your true potential. Capella University's game-changing FlexPath format helps you learn at your own pace and fit earning a degree into your life. From before you enroll to after you graduate, you'll be supported by people who are invested in your success so you can pursue your goals knowing that help is available if you need it. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Today on the James Altucher Show. So you retired from the racing You're 36. Do you think at any age someone could say, you know what, I'm passionate about X and they can start moving forward and create, you know, magic success? Do I believe that that's possible? Absolutely. Because you're doing it now with all your, like who would have thought you would have gone from race car driving to a vineyard to a clothing line to books? I think that your true passions in life they come off so well, it resonates with people. People can tell when you're really into something and when you're not. When you're educated, when you're passionate, when you light up about it, it's that metaphysical energy that happens when you love something and people are like, wow, like look at you just light up when you talk about that. Right, it you creates know? more energy, right? Yes, more energy and it's like a magnet, you know? So I have... Danica Patrick with me, perhaps one of the most well-recognized female athletes in history. For me, one of the most recognized, if you were walking down the street, I would recognize you no matter what. But also for me, you'd be the most recognizable race car driver. Like, I don't know what Dale Earnhardt looks like, but I know what you look like because you've also been in 13 Super Bowl commercials for GoDaddy, uh, more than any other celebrity, right? Mm -hmm. You've been... Yeah, maybe, maybe the maybe some Budweiser animated animal has been. <laughs> maybe some dog or horse that's been in a lot right. of them. <laughs> and then, but in I don't know. I'm not the expert on race car driving, although we're going to talk a lot about it. But you were the only woman to have won pole at NASCAR's legendary Daytona 500. You're the only woman to have won an Indy car race. You're one of Time Magazine's most influential people. You recently hosted the ESPY Awards and the American Country Music Awards. I don't know. Is there any award I'm missing? Is there anything that you're most proud of? In the you just retired yeah. from racing. You did Indy and NASCAR, right? Mm-hmm. In, in 2018, and mm-hmm. then you were like, "That's it." Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah. So it's two questions. What's is there a award I'm missing that maybe you're like the most proud of that was small? And nobody thinks about. Um. Um. Oh, when I won on Chopped, I was really, really excited about that award. What was What was Chopped? Uh, the cooking show. It's okay. like a cooking competition where you uh, make um, it's mystery baskets each round, and there's three rounds. And the first round is appetizer round. 
The second round is the entree round, and then the last round is dessert. And so I, I, I won. I was pretty excited. Uh, about what did you cook? Uh, it was somewhat sport based. So there was like a little, like, I think the first, and this is a while ago, but the first one had maybe some sort of like Gatorade element. There's always a twist. Like, there's always one item that you're like, what the heck am I going to do with that? Um, but yeah, I mean, like, it was like salmon Gatorade. was one of them. And I think I took some like, it was like lemon lime Gatorade, and I added some like real fresh lemon too, as well, when I sauteed the kale or Swiss chard or something like that that they gave. Um, and then, uh, there was steak and, um, what was it? There was potatoes, but I can't remember what the little mystery ingredient was, but I microwave the sweet potato because I know that the quickest way to cook potatoes in the microwave, um, can't wait for that to boil in 30 minutes. Cause that's all the longer you had. And then the, then the final round had, I think protein powder in it. So I mixed it with like a yogurt to thicken it and to add flavor and then made it like a neo, neo like a, like a Neapolitan kind of thing where it was stacked up. And who, who, then who I made like against? a liquor drink and. What? Who who were you up against? Um, it was sport based. So uh, there was um, the Amanda Beard was the one that me and her were in the final round, and she has like a garden, and she's really she knows her stuff really well. But um, but I beat her. And um, who else is in it? Was she um, was she upset? Was she like? I, I have a garden. Who she's she's a race car driver. What are you doing? Yeah, uh, she didn't say that out loud, but I didn't also get to see all two hours of her interview footage. So who knows? You know, maybe. Uh, but I doubt they would have kept that. They wouldn't um, have left that on the cutting room who floor. Who was on there? It was um, there was a football player on there and a wrestler, like an old wrestler. Um, so they they weren't that great, but but Amanda was a pretty good cook. And who the, who are the judges? I think Aaron Sanchez, maybe, which I just saw him. I went and did a charity event for my wine, Somnium, in New Orleans. Uh, Emeril Agassi has a big um, charity event down there. So I went to that, and I think he was one of the judges. He was there. Either that or it was Scott Conan. I can't remember. I went on Chop Jr. as a judge, so I can't remember which one was on which. Um, I can't remember the other two judges. This was probably like six years ago, so I can't, I can't even remember. But that's great that that... This is probably why you started to aim towards retiring from racing is that when I ask you what award I'm missing, that maybe there you go. You know, yes. the first thing that comes to mind is a cooking one. You've, I mean, <laughs> how many racing uh, competitions or how many races have you been in? Yeah, in a your lot. Life? A lot, thousands, I'm sure. I mean, they started when you were 10, year, 10 yeah. years old. You started doing go-karts. What happened mm -hmm. when you were like at an amusement park and got in a go-kart and you're like, oh my God, I'm going to... I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. <laughs> uh, nah, no, it was much more dangerous than that. In fact, the first time that I drove a go-kart, um, maybe I had driven a fun kart at some point in time. I don't remember that being the case, but it was really my sister who wanted to race and I just didn't want to get left out. Like, do you have siblings? Yeah. Like, And you have kids. So, yeah. you know, between the two of them, you realize like if one gets to do it, the other gets a chance, right? Right, yeah. Everything wanna, has to be equal. It's it socialism. has to be equal. So, absolutely. It starts in the family. Um, starts at home. So uh, I didn't want to get left out. So I was like, I'll do it. I'll try it. And um, turns out I was pretty good at it. So um, how did you but know the you very were good? first time I was in a go-kart, I crashed. Uh, my dad put the go karts together, and m he owned a glass business, and we were they were right next door to a construction company or a packaging company, and so there was tons of space back there for the trucks to maneuver around. So um, after the go karts got put together, they took some you know brake cleaner and WD forty cans and s made a big circle with them. And my sister and I, because my sister did it too at first, um, we went and drove around in circles and got it going for the first time. And thank God, this is the day of like you know, on your shoulder video cameras, like, oh, get the kids doing everything. Um, maybe it wasn't that big, but um, <laughs> but there was footage of, of us driving for the very first time and um, the my brakes failed. So instead of being smart, which it's tough to do at 10 years old to do anything too smart, um, I, I just went straight and I hit a concrete wall. And I'm assuming you didn't get hurt. Well, I did. I had like, my dad said he thought he killed me. I... Like my arms flew back and my arm was like landed on the muffler. So it was smoking and like my jacket was on fire and one of those super cool like neon puffy jackets from the 80s, I'm sure. Um, and then uh, uh, I had bruises up my legs from hitting the steering column in the middle. And and do you think that like the adrenaline of that, with, with adrenaline, right, or in stress, 
there's two ways to resolve it. There's one where you're like, ugh, I'm never going to do this again. And then the stress goes down. And then there's the other where you're like, I'm going to get so good at this. I'm never going to crash like that again. Yeah, I'd and say then I'm, the more the, goes I'm down. more the latter. Um, yeah. like what, what, what about that moment made you say, I'm going to get right back in this and improve? I think it's because you do it and you realize, oh, I'm okay. Like, oh, okay. Even sometimes the worst isn't that bad. Like if you if that hadn't happened, if you hadn't been playing around with go karts, like you were you were an athletic kid, like what do you think? You think you would have still been an athlete, or what other what other direction do you think you would have gone in life? Well, as much as I believe in the power of the mind, I'm pretty sure I wasn't going to be able to dunk a basketball. Um, so there's some sports I couldn't have done, um, at least not at the highest level. But actually, you know what's funny is though is I mean I guess I could have been like a point guard or something maybe, but um, in eighth grade I remember being at a basketball game because I played volleyball, basketball, and I did cheerleading in grade school. And after the basketball game, the high school coaches were like recruiting. And so they came over to me and they're like, we'd really like you to play in high school. And uh, I said, like a, like a young, young girl, I was like, well, I'm not sure if I'm going to do that or cheerleading. And I did cheerleading. Like I just imagine with cheerleading, all these cheerleading movies where they go to camp and mm-hmm. one cheerleading leading group from the ghetto fights the other cheerleading group <laughs> from... The aristocratic, posh town, <laughs> and then they learn to like each other at the end. Was it like that? You're all just fighting over that silly spirit stick at camp um, and never let it touch the ground. That's what I remember about the spirit stick. You had to decorate it, and it had to be on a pillow or something. It could never touch the ground. And did you do like pyramids? Were you oh, on, yeah. Oh, were, yeah. Were you on the top of the pyramid? <laughs> I could do both, actually. Um, I was I have good balance, um, and I'm small, so I could be a flyer, as they call it. And then I also am very strong, um, so I could base as well. So there was actually a girl in high school when I um, I only was in cheerleading in high school for a little while. I ended up getting kicked off the squad, but um, but I uh, that, wait we wait the, wait. <laughs> hang on, I'm finishing this story first. Um, so. You know, you have to be of a similar height to be a base because you're standing as naturally as you can to be strong and stable. And, you know, someone's feet need to be in each set of hands. So, you know, you need to be of the same height. So there's another girl that was a similar height that was also very strong. So um, so I could base as well as be a flyer. Oh, wait, now you want to know why I got kicked off. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, well, it's an interesting story, actually. Um, it, so I was, it was, I think it was sophomore year. I left to go to England and France for um, to to for racing, like to go watch some races. And um, yeah, it's actually not so interesting. I got too many demerits, so oh because God. you were pursuing your passion. I do. I just wanted people to think I was going to say something like I was caught with like drugs or something like that, and it was well, like a total we'll rebel, or we'll like I was the, drunk at practice. You just said no. the phrase "I was caught with drugs," so we'll just edit this to say. <laughs> Shoot, I forgot. That's how this works. I get so laxadaisical. Fake news. I get so laxadays when I get into these uh, nice, warm, mm. long, long speaking environments where I'm trying to be funny. We we've lulled. Not. We got stand up comedy in the background. We lulled you into thinking this was. Uh, Gonna be nice and, and easy. Just, but this is this is purely just clickbait. That's all we're doing exactly. here is just finding what Danica is worth. Patrick thrown out of school for I did, and then you're and then the audio. <laughs> I was caught using drugs, um, but you must have had a sense like pretty quickly. Oh my gosh! Not only am I good at, not only do I love doing this, it's fun, but I'm good at it. Like when did, I'm always curious. Like obviously, you became one of the best, if not the best in the world and where where do you think you started to realize oh this could be something extraordinary for me or we always focused on process i just want to get better today as opposed to like hey 20 years from now i'm going to be you know a contender for every hall of fame possible hmm all right what's your question then the question is did you did you love it so much you thought I'm going to make a career for the next 30 years out of it? Or do you love it so much? You said, okay, I'm going to just, this is what I want to do today as opposed to other things. I was, I'm a long-term thinker, um, which is why I don't get wrapped up in how I get there. Um, because I'm more thinking about where I see it in 5, 10, 20, 30 years than where I see it today or tomorrow. Um, because that's short-sighted to me. 
And it will also lock you into thinking that you need to be doing a certain thing. And if you just stay fixed on the long-term goal, it doesn't really matter how you get there, right? As long as you keep that in mind as a focal point. Um, so what was your, what was your so long-term the fo- goal? So the goal? long-term goal was to, to win the Indy 500 when I was a kid. And, and, and at what age did you have that long-term goal? Uh, I started racing when I was 10, so probably around then. And even though at that time you were mostly racing in these go in these cart competitions, so you were able yeah. to say, "Hey, if I'm good at this, yep. I'm going to start to be good at all kinds of driving." Because yeah, because that's very different from yeah. Indy is very yeah, different from totally. NASCAR. And there's some people that it doesn't even translate when you go from you know. Uh, the the next level, the triple A's of racing to IndyCar, like you know, Atlantic to IndyCar might have tr- not have translated. Just like um, you know, triple um, A, you know, triple A's baseball, you know, they get you know brought up to the big leagues, and it doesn't translate every time. So um, it doesn't always translate either. So for me to think, obviously, as a young. 10, 11 year old go karter um, that I was going to, you know, make it all the way through all the different levels and all the time span between, you know, 10 and 25, you know, how am I going to get there? Yeah, it was just a dream, but that that's something that I don't even know. I don't really know if that's something that I was born with or something that I learned. I'm sure on some level it's a little bit of both. My dad's quite the dreamer. Um, and it sounds like they were supportive. Like, yeah, absolutely. Like, how did you enter your first like uh, race, your first competition? Um, I mean, we practiced a little bit, and then Dad signed us up at the local go kart track for you know me and my sister started, and we started in the back. We couldn't even keep up on the parade laps, which parade laps are where you go really slow and kind of get in formation, and then they drop the green flag, and then you go. So, I mean, we couldn't even keep up going slow. And, and I was winning by the middle of the season. So, so, so in the very first time, you were like all the way behind, but you didn't. Yeah. You didn't say to yourself, "Oh well, I guess that's it for me." And car racing. So this is the nature versus nurture thing. Yeah. There, to some extent, you whether it was nature or not, that very first time, you're still gonna kind of suck compared to the people who have been doing it ten years longer than you. You'd so hope you so. have to be or able. You'd think so. <laughs> you have to push through, right? So how did you? How did you say to yourself? And I believe you that there's a so, big nature component, but then yeah. how do you, you? There has to be some. So nurture. this is what I loved about racing. This is what I loved the most was setting a goal and accomplishing it. So for me, I loved and I. I so going faster was always the goal. And when you're practicing racing, you're going off of lap time. So you took you 38 seconds and 38 seconds and 19 tenths, you know, 38.9. And then you come back in and you're like 38.6 and then 38.5 and then a 38 flat. And you just figure out how you can go tenths of a tenths of a second faster every lap. And uh, did you have someone teaching you tricks like, oh, when you make oh, this? Oh, sure, kind of yep. Uh-huh, my dad was telling me. I mean, he used to he did race when he was younger, so he knew a lot about it. And he also knew about setting the setting it up and the mechanics of it because he would he built snowmobiles and all kind of built built midget cars and um, so he had a lot of technical information so he would teach me about driving he would teach me about um, he would also work on the setup so if it didn't want to turn very well if it turned too well you know he would make changes on the go-kart and so yeah we were working on handling as well as the line and getting faster and faster was what I loved and what and what what ultimately separated you from the pack in your local community cart community like what did they not have somebody like your dad who worked with them uh, I mean I'm sure I had some advantages time? having a dad who had such you know so much technical knowledge um, but as I more hear about it today than I did obviously back then cuz I was just doing it but you know just my level of of passion and commitment and drive was was just kind of unique and and then the ability to go with it, like I wanted to get better all the time. So you practice constantly. So I would apparently I would always I would ask to go practice all the time, and um, because I loved getting faster. And so even in you know when I was you know proportionately you know probably the as fast as I ever was compared to anyone else, it was never enough. Like well, what's the fastest? We could be, I could be like I could be like a second faster than the than the next fastest driver in my class, and. We just keep pushing. What's the fastest a go kart could go? Which seconds a lot. I know it doesn't sound like a lot, but it is. What's that? What's the fastest a go kart could go? 
Oh, there's t- go karts that'll go a hundred. I think probably the ones that I drove max speed was maybe somewhere around eighty or ninety, maybe. So the, w- w- the first time you won a kart race, you know, w- I remember. W- tell me about it. <laughs> I lucked into it. Um, I was third, and the two car go karts in front of me crashed, and it was the last lap, and I won. And then I won a lot more after that. Because then once you saw, and I remember I th- went ac- came across went across the line, and I put both my hands in the air like a old victory, you know, woohoo, go me! And I got in trouble because I took, I wasn't ten and two. Because you weren't you. you were, because <laughs> I took my hands off the wheel. <laughs> oh, and so one. You know, it makes me think of like, let's say people set themselves a goal. I'm going to do 20 push-ups, or I'm going to do 30, I'm going to do 40. No matter what number they pick, like three or four before they hit that number, they get tired and they feel like, oh, I can't do that last three. It doesn't even matter what number they pick. Totally. They can pick 10, 20, yep. 30, 40. Yep. Um, but once you saw that, oh, I could be number one, yeah, these two guys crashed, but I could be number one. Did it become easier after that? Like just kind of the confidence sort of mixed in with your skill learning? Well, that becomes the new expectation level, right? So just like if you need to do 40 push-ups, you get tired at 35. And if you need to do 100, you get tired at 90 maybe, you know? And um, so it's just all about expectation level and what you believe is possible. So once you once I won, I was like, oh my God, I can win. And I really was, I believed it. And when you believe in something enough, it usually becomes your new reality. And once you're hitting number one at the, you know, local go kart tracks and stuff, did you start thinking national or worldwide on go kart, or did you start looking at like, well, now there's I can go even faster in an indie car? Like, which which direction? I or was both just directions? thinking like I could make a, I could like do this for the rest of my life. Like I'd. I'd be an, I'll be an indie car driver someday, or I'll, you know, that was what I was thinking of. I didn't even know where to go next. Like, I didn't know that there was local and then regional and then national. So, my dad was the one that did that, but I just knew that I was good and I wanted to win the Indy 500. <laughs> and what, what, like you mentioned before, you don't always know what skills are going to translate. Like, an indie car can go over 200 miles an hour. You were going, you know, 80 or 90. What, once you switch, how did you make the switch to Indy? And what? How old were you? What? What happened? What was? What was the next big push? Um, I was uh, fourteen, and uh, I won a lot. And um, there was uh, you won a lot in carts. Yeah, I did. And um, there was one year where I won thirty some out of forty some races. Like I won pretty much all. Did year. you get money for those? No. It's just like trophies. Yeah, I win. Okay, trophies. Yeah. Um, and not everyone got a ribbon back in those days. Um, so uh, I, w- I went to the Indy 500, and I was walking around and being helped out by Lynn St. James, who was a female driver. And um, so she was just kind of introducing me to people and you know being a little bit of a mentor. And she introduced me to a family that um, you know was very wealthy. And I went into their suite, and I was uh, sitting at the bar. <laughs> and I'm sure I was ordering kitty cocktail. Um, and, and I remember there was a British guy, and I asked him, I guess, all the right questions because two years later when I was 16, they said, we've been following the same family. They said, we've been following your career. Um, <clears throat> we'd like to talk to you. And they proposed me going over to England and racing. And um, so I did. In, the indie, in, in an indie car? No. And um, so I was in go-karts at that point in time. And so it would have been to make the jump to cars. So open wheel cars. So the difference between open wheel and stock car is it's really easy. If the wheels are exposed, if you, the tires are exposed and, and bodywork is not generally flush with it, it's called open wheel. So like, um, what's, I don't understand. So, what's, like a car outside, is that open wheel? No. So, what's, uh, so what is an open wheel? Because there's body work right next to it, right? Mm-hmm. So the wheel, you can't climb the wheel. Okay. Open wheel, you could climb the wheel, wheel to wheel. You could like interlock and launch and bad things happen. So open wheel is um, less body work, more like a cockpit, like a skinny little cockpit in the middle. And so I started with the ones that were like that, but they didn't have any wings on them. So the wings create downforce. So just like if you stick your hand out the window when you're driving, and you you know aim your fingertips up, your hand's going to want to go back, right? So if you aim them down, then your hand kind of wants to get pulled down, and that's how a wing works. It's just you know the wing adds downforce, so it pushes the car down into the track and allows you to go around corners faster. 
so so you made the jump from car. What what was the jump then from from when you went to Go-karts the UK to open wheel cars without wings? And then I did two different series over there. I lived there for three years. And then when I came back, I started racing open wheel cars with wings. And so when you went there, obviously you were sixteen. You were like a junior in high school. Yep. Was it was it even a, a decision at all, or did you just automatically assume, okay, high school's over. Um, this is what I love doing. Yeah, I'm gonna do I, it. I mean, the idea of not having to go to my human anatomy class anymore. Fantastic. <laughs> um, so I did. Uh, I pulled out of high school halfway through my junior year. I was 16 years old. And did anyone say you were crazy? I don't think I was there long enough for to for to hear it. Huh. Um, I think my parents probably thought they were a little crazy, but I mean, at the end of the day, it's funny because we were just talking about school before we started yeah. this in, this conversation upstairs, and um, you know, I mean, look, I think that probably there are some engineers that work on race cars that it probably helps to know a little physics. Um, Probably not. Probably not. It's just common sense, right? And it's just a math equation they can plug into a calculator, right? So anyway, um, I I don't think that, uh, I don't think it really really was too big of a problem that I have my GED, but I did get my GED. And, but, but then you saw My good enough diploma. Right. You're, so you're, you're a high school graduate technically. Good enough. And, and then you go to the UK and what happens is is does your is your family with you or now no, you're just No, I'm by myself. So mm-hmm. I um first moved over I lived with someone an older gentleman who did research and development for a Formula 1 team and then after that that was just a couple of months and then when I went back for the full season um I cause it was end of 98 through the early middle part of 2001 um um, so it was two full seasons. The first full season, I lived in um, lived with a couple of girls in um, Milton Keynes, and then the second full year, I lived in outside of Birmingham, um, Birmingham, uh, with a family. And then part the third year, or the fourth year, as you could call it, but the uh, the the end of the three year term, uh, I was by myself. I lived by myself when I was eighteen. So you, you mentioned the first person, he was doing research and development for a Formula One team. What does research and development mean for a car racing team? Uh, going to the wind tunnel, testing new parts, testing new aerodynamic bits, you know, m- making, making parts, trying new ones, changing their setup, aiming them in different directions, changing their shape. Um, How much can that add? Like if you have... The, like did you must have learned also a lot of the nuances and subtleties of all these aerodynamics and so on. Would you were you ever at the point where you were making suggestions? Why don't you do this tweak to the car or this or this? Only if I'd tried it. I wouldn't say that I was someone who was like, I was thinking about this the other day. It'd be more like when we tried that, that really worked. Or hey, if this kind of thing is helping, let's see how far we can take it. You know, so how much? What percentage could that add to the speed of a car? Or to the the likelihood of winning. The rule in IndyCar racing was that you added downforce until you were flat out. Meaning, what's does flat out mean? Meaning not lifting off the throttle. And anything that you can do to add downforce until you get flat out is beneficial. So um, in IndyCar racing, though, we would get to the point, most any oval, um, even some of the short tracks that were just flat one mile ovals. I mean, we could get to the point where we were flat out around those tracks too. Um, but you, uh, you would add, you, so some of the tracks that we went to in IndyCar, you'd trim out as tolerably as you could. Um, and even if it was tolerable, sometimes it was still slower because the car could still slide in the corner. And if you're moving laterally instead of forward, then you're losing time. So, um, so, you, so anyway, so in let's say in NASCAR, you're almost never flat out, um, just on the super speedways, really. Um, so, you know, any downforce that you could add to those cars was always beneficial, always. And so, so you have you could have all the same problems, same handling problems. You could just do them faster. So, what what is a like, did you ever get to a point when you're going so fast, uh, maybe you're going 200 miles an hour, and I don't know, I mentioned to you earlier, I, I once, this was like five or six years ago, I took one race car Oh yeah, tell me lesson. about that. So I went up to this track in Monticello, New York, and a uh, professional race car driver gave me a lesson, and I was terrified. I couldn't go faster than 90 miles per hour, I get too scared, and... Uh, uh, and then afterwards, he said, "He said you're absolutely the worst student I ever had. 
But he said the the ups he said the upside to that is you don't even have any bad habits. You just have no habits at all. So maybe there's something you can work with here. But I was I was there was just all these nuances though that I didn't understand. Like the way you would turn on a track, you got to go to this unintuitive side. Like what what? So what? you you mean turn an apex exit? Where you would turn in from one point, then because you're trying to create the largest radius as possible, because the tighter the radius, the slower you have to go. See, that's if you have to get one car from. <laughs> if you have to go from forwards to going backwards and make a really tight turn, that's hard. Now, if you can make it a big wide sweeping turn and get to the, get going the other way, you're going to be able to carry a lot more speed doing that. So, so if you see a turn coming, you go to and let's say the turn's going towards your right, you would go to start. Angling towards the left side of the track, so you can make the widest. Yeah. Turn. So if you're gonna make a right, you start on the left side, and then you turn. You have your turn in point where you start aiming into the corner. So it kind of depends on you know your. Well, let's just be simple. Yeah. So if it's a ninety degree corner, then you have your turn in point. Your exit is the very is the inside of the track now at the bottom, right in the middle, and then your exit is where you meet up with the outside of the track on the other side. So if if you're trying, let's say someone's right in front of you, and I'm sorry for all these naive questions. We'll, okay. we'll get to the bio stuff. But I'm Most just really people curious. don't know. So if you're trying to pass somebody. As long and, as we get into metaphysical stuff at some point in time, we'll be having a good time. We'll, 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 we'll get into the metaphysical okay. physical stuff. I like that stuff. So uh, uh, you, you want to pass somebody. What are you strategically thinking? Like someone who's good, who's professional, is right in front of you, mm-hmm. and they know what they're doing just like you know what you're doing. Mm-hmm. How, how do you start thinking about how to pass them? Uh, no, first thing, if I'm passing them without, uh, on my own, without having any influence on them, I'm thinking about how I can get back to full throttle sooner than them. So you're thinking like in a turn, you're not full throttle and you want to be- Yeah, if you're making a 90 degree corner, I might back my entry up a little bit, be a little slower, I might turn in a little later so I'm straighter coming off, so I might apex the corner a little further around, but my car will be more rotated. And I'm thinking about getting flat all the way full throttle earlier than them. That way, when I come off the corner, I'm aimed straighter, so I have less wheel resistance getting off the corner because I don't have my hands turned as much. And I'm full throttle sooner, so I should be able to beat him down, but to the next corner. But don't you think he's thinking the same thing and is going to? He's thinking he doesn't want to get beat on entry either. So he's thinking I can't break too early because they'll just she'll just dive down to the inside of me. So when you're being chased, you're thinking of entry and exit. When you're chasing, the smartest thing is to just think about exit. You could also outbreak them and dive bomb them. That's what it's called. Um, so that's the next alternative. Or you can pressure them into making a mistake and drive really close, look to their inside, make it look like you're passing them, but make them have to be guarded, maybe miss the corner, lock up a bray, you know, lock up a tire. Um, so beat them on exit, beat them on entry, and dive bomb them, or you can just push or you can just push them so hard to make a mistake. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to or these different sports to to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays 
under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So This holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. So at this point, you're you know doing all this racing. You start moving into Indy racing, NASCAR racing. Um, you're, you're getting success after success. You're starting to get well-known. At some point, did it click for you? Oh, I'm more than just a race car tri- driver now. I'm like a personality. Like people know who I am. Mm. Yeah, I think when I drove Formula Atlantic, when I came back to the States and um, I had a sponsor that was did a lot of promotion, and um, it was like my first big sponsor. Uh, they, the, I remember feeling like I was getting more publicity and advertising and interviews than the guys that were at the top level of the next series up. And Did they get jealous of you? I don't know. Were they like, oh, you don't, you're only getting that because you're a woman? Did yeah, they give you yeah, like a I'm hard sure. time? I'm sure. 
And I knew some of it was true. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I mean, I am because I'm different. And and then suddenly, as you become a personality, that's another type of currency you can use for mm-hmm. success. So mm-hmm. you can now branch out into. Obviously, you got sponsorships. You were in the mm-hmm. Super Bowl thirteen times for GoDaddy. Mm-hmm. Um, now and now that you've been, you've just retired. Although people sometimes say they retired and then the next year they start re- doing their thing again. So, do you feel like you're definitely retired? Oh, one hundred percent. I think to myself, I cannot believe I said yes to doing the Indy Five Hundred. God, that was hard. Um, so, there's no way I'm going back. And and so now you're starting to expand into all these other businesses. Like right in front of us here, we have. Uh, a bottle of wine from your winery, the Somnium, Somnium uh, Winery. You we also have to have... put it phonetically on the front of the bottle because it is tough. Yeah, it's also it's a Latin word. It's foreign. It's a foreign language. It's hard to. It's it's like italic. Cursive, so, yeah. kind of. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, you have your own clothing line, Warrior. You yep. um, uh, wrote a, just wrote a book about fitness. It's pretty intense. Pretty intense. Yeah. And, uh, and there's there's diets. There's uh, Physical Workout exercises. program. Where do you see I do speaking engagements? Yeah, you do speaking mm-hmm. engagements. Yeah. So where do you see like obviously to become the best in the world at something you had to do even though you even though there's a nature component and you had talent obviously there was ten thousand hours of skill and practice and learning and passion that you had to put into it. Do you see yourself borrowing hours from learning how to learn one thing to be the best in the world to become the best? Or, or close to the best sort of an entrepreneurship? Yeah. Like, I think where do you, I've where had you, to learn some Because now more. It's, a, it's another crossover. It's carts to indie to yeah. entrepreneurship. I mean, I, I, I think there was a lot of things with racing where it was very much a doing kind of sport, and I'm much more of a doer. I'm less about details. But uh, with these other businesses and especially starting them up, I've had to be more about the details, um, hiring the right people, um, creative, right creative direction, um, taking matters into my own hands. I guess I'm used to having a company like GoDaddy just run the marketing program where you're like, okay, done. And then I'm like, wait, I am marketing for these companies. So like, I remember when I did my book um, and I was uh, getting ready to do the cover show shoot as well as the uh, lifestyle photos for the interior, I was like, here it comes. And then I went to the mall. I remember I was walking around. I was like, oh, wait a second. I'm wardrobe for this. Oh my God. I'm shot list for this. Holy crap. Like I got to make sure there's lunch for everybody. Like I was running the show because it was my project. So, um, so just something like that, where I had to, um, do it all myself. That's not something that I've had to do in my career very much. I'm pretty much just, you know, I have someone to take care of the car and someone takes care of the schedule and someone. So yeah. And but, but you say you're not detail oriented, but there must've been in, in, striving again to become uh, the number one race car driver and win all these races. Yeah. There's a lot of details. You have well, to learn. I'm detail oriented from a creative perspective. So there's a lot about racing that's cre- that's more creative based. It's more, um, you know, the driving, the art of driving, you know. Like what's creative um, in there? And I, I believe you, uh, but what's. The lines, the way you pass, the setup of the car, what's important, like, you know, just kind of the strategy of it, the, you know, the feel of the car and how it's handling um, and what you need to achieve that. So sort of the physical creativeness of it and, and the driving and the feeling of the car. Um, but, you know, then to do the math on the other side of, you know, setup stuff and whatever else, like, no. Unless the setup had to do with man- manipulating numbers around here and there to project the right amount of travel for the car or the rake of the car or the, um, you know, something like that where it was like a balance of certain things. So There's sh- like, a lot of details. <laughs> replug in things. You're like, oh, if I do this and then that and then lower that and then preload that. And then you're like, oh. So, but just to like plug a number in and be like, do this and do that. Like that for me is just, I'm not a very math oriented person. So unless there's some sort of balance and feel to something, it enters into just the arithmetic realm, which is like brain shut down for me. Well, okay. So like in business, you obviously know very few businesses are one person businesses. Businesses <laughs> hire people to do, like you want to do the accounting for your business, you would hire an accountant. Yeah. <laughs> you want to do the software for your business, you would hire right. a software programmer. Um, but you also have to motivate these people Correct. so that they have the same vision and sense of meaning in what they're doing that you have the same yeah, passion about it which is the hardest part it is that hard like you're you were obviously able to do it with 
what's it called? Your crew in racing? Like, yeah, but that, I'm saying that was hard. Like that was a lot of people and that was a lot of people, especially being someone so, you know, being a girl that, you know, they had to truly in their hearts believe I was capable. And so know? how did you do the motivation then? I mean, you just show up and you hang around. And you know what I ended up finding out? And I'm, and I, and I'm, I'm not making excuses. I'm just m- drawing an example of, of even, you know, of my situation. Um, I did everything I could to try and hang around and be social and, you know, be friends with these people so that they would work for me on a love basis of like, we care about you as a human being and a person. We want to do our best for you. Um, but then I finally realized after a long, long time, and it was just a few years ago, I'm like, oh my God. Because I didn't really love going to the shop and hanging out. It was boring to me. Like, I don't want to work. I don't work on the car. Like, I don't care. I don't, I don't, I don't care about what 57 Chevy you have. Like, I, I mean, I just don't really like a car. I just, it doesn't, it's not interesting to me. Um, and then I was like, oh my God, you know what? Like, I don't like to hang out because it's all guys. Like I, I, if it was a whole team of, I realized if it was a whole team of girls. Oh my God, you should have done that. You should have hired a whole team of girls to do all that stuff. <laughs> well, it might have been more fun sometimes, but you know, number one, I would have related better, and there would have been like the camaraderie and the girl talk, and like we'd have got each other, you know, um, you know. And so I got some. There were some people I really liked, but just not not maybe as much as I could have because it's all guys. And then also, it's not appropriate sometimes to. Because there are plenty of drivers that go out and hang out with their crew. Like, you know, they go out to dinner or go to lunch with them or something like that or be texting. I'm like, it's not appropriate also for me to just like go out one-on-one with these guys at the same, you know what I mean? So it's also somewhat not appropriate at times. And then um, it's- Was there ever I, like harassment in it? Like No, that? no. But I mean, I'm very like when I'm the kind of girl who's like, um, if I am, if I know the guy and I don't know the girl and I'm going up to me, I will go straight over to the girl first and be like, hi, I'm Dana. You know, I'm not going to act like you're not there. Cause I know the guy I'm going to do girl code and I'll be like, hi, how are you? And then be like, oh, Hey, good to see you. You know? So, I mean, just, I'm all about appropriate. So, um, I, I would want, that's how I would want to be treated. So that's how I try and treat others. So, but, so now, trans- you know, so it wasn't that much fun. So that, so, you know, part of it was work. That was the work part, like going to the shop and hanging out and blah, blah, blah. Like I didn't enjoy that part, but I did it because I knew it was important to develop camaraderie. Um, I just think it could have been easier if I, if it was all girls. And so, so again, how do you, how do you translate that in your experience? Like, cause, cause that was a part of how you became the best at racing. What aspects of that translate into entrepreneurship? Now, obviously now you have a passion for entrepreneurship. You're starting all these businesses, you're thinking of marketing, you're thinking of branding, you're thinking of distribution, yep. you're starting new businesses. Uh, what's what's trans? And you've been exposed to a lot of businesses, like just working with GoDaddy and watching yep. their, their growth over the years. You, you had a great education, you had great mentors already in entrepreneurship. How do you see, what, what, what are you bringing from that experience into your new businesses? Um, you know, quality people. I mean, so, you know, for sure, with the help of GoDaddy, knowing that I have, you know, a good website, I have the domains that I need, I'm protected in that area. If I'm selling something, e-commerce, you know, you name it, there's technical support, there's marketing support. I have people as well that um, have worked with me from a marketing standpoint. So if I want to go do an interview for Somnium, you know, my wine, I have a team who's used to, who can call Wine Spectator and, you know, we can see if they're interested in doing a piece with me. So, um, you know, having the right people, the right help, the right support, as best as you know. And it doesn't mean that doesn't change either. Um, as we talked about before, sometimes you got to not, not only know who to hire, but who to fire. But, um, you know, having the right people around you as much as humanly possible, and especially people that are going to be honest um, and people that are going to be invested, right? Because you want, like I've even said with, with racing, and it, it's the same for any, any, anything, there's a difference between between doing the job and doing a great job. There's a really big difference between the two of them. Um, and so finding people that will do a great job, which means above and beyond. It means how can you, you know, tell being, when you're interviewing them that this is the type of person who's going to do a great job? Because everyone's resume is perfect until you until you meet them. <laughs> uh, you know, um, someone who and and you usually don't know until you get going, but. Um, I mean, their confidence is the first thing that comes across to you. And then over time, you just recognize whether or not they're a self-starter or not. And self-starter meaning like they're doing things and taking the initiative to start a program or call this person or do this event. And you don't have to ask them. 
Um, so, um, so a self-starter is someone who can work from home. Um, that's another thing. I mean, you know, being able to have the discipline to allow the time and the space to get your job done instead of just sitting in front of the TV and taking an extra 30 minutes of coffee in the morning or going to a workout or getting your hair done. You know what I mean? Someone that's a self-starter that's going to be disciplined to get it done. Um, and, you know, if you're lucky, you find someone that has no hours and they work whenever you need them to. And um, I love that. And then they're also, then I also give them total flexibility to be like, okay, yeah, you need to go get your hair cut at noon today. I don't care. Go. Like, you want to go on vacation? Please go on vacation. If you get all your work done and you get, I mean, like, please, you, everyone deserves some time for themselves. But, you know, it also comes in the package of like, there's no such thing as hours, right? There's just like, if I call you at eight o'clock at night because, you know, something, you know, it just hit the fan, you know, I, you know, I know I will have someone who's well willing to help me and ready. Um, so, um, yeah. Well, why are you doing it? Like you, you did well with, the driving and the sponsorships. Yeah. And- I mean, when I, when I was, uh, I mean, last year was when all my companies were launching, it seemed like all at the same time at the beginning of 2017. And um, with the book, with the workout program, with the book, which had the workout program in it, with the wine that finally launched and with my clothing line, it all kind of was happening at the same time. And I, and, and it was just coincidental really. Um, and, uh, you know, people were like, oh, is this a, you know, backup plan for, you know, after racing? And, and I, kindly, confidently, politely would respond with, I don't need a backup plan. I mean, I have enough money. I don't have to do anything. Um, so uh, they're just things that I'm passionate about. They're just passion projects. And like so- like with the clothing, what, you know, obviously there's a lot of uh, athletic wear, clothing out there. You know, we talked about Lululemon when we were chatting before the yeah. podcast. What makes yours, how did you kind of come up with an idea that you feel is unique on the clothing side? given that you had no experience at all in clothing. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that, you know, being a large consumer really helps. I mean, I work out a ton. Um, so uh, so between, I mean, the two things I think that can make it a little bit um, unique is um, one is just the fact that I know I am particular about it all because I've consumed every other product out there and I just want to take all the best, all the things that were wrong with each one individually and combine it into one and make it perfect. So, you know, I work out, so I know how shorts should fit. I'm not perfect. My body is not always perfect. So I want things to be flattering and I know how to maybe, you know, help make it look like that. I'm not a, you know, six foot, hundred and... 21 pound, uh, you know, yoga lady. I don't, don't, you know what I mean? Like I, I don't, I don't look like that. So, you know, the fact that, um, the fact that I feel like I have the experience and the knowledge and the, you know, been using these products for a long time. And then on top of it, I think that, uh, this is more a little bit on the metaphysical side. Um, but you know, the name warrior is meant to just convey that kind of an attitude to you, to be a warrior. And then even the logo of the Thunderbird means unlimited happiness in Native American culture, um, which is why I picked it. Um, and because I think it lo- I thought it was kind of a good thing to kind of riff on um, to make a to make the logo. So you know, the the line I want the line to stand and convey confidence and um, and give you that give you a mindset when you put it on. So And so yeah, so let's let's talk about like, mindset. You know, shirts with words on it. You know, people love that cuz they're like today I'm going to be a warrior. Today I'm, you know, shut up let me sleep kind of day, you know, whatever. <laughs> I like those shirts. I mean, I need more of those shirts. <laughs> um but but let's talk about that because there is a connection between a lot of what you do and what you believe. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you set a long-term goal and obviously you had a lot of talent, but but you needed to to work at it to hit your long-term goals. A lot of people don't work at it or, or their mindset at some point says, okay, I'm, I could only do 40 push-ups and not 50, so I'm gonna get tired at 38 and that's it. And that's all mindset. So you haven't let mindset slow you down ever, it seems. Like was there ever a point even with racing that you felt like, ugh, this is, this is my limit. I just lost this race. That's probably my limit. I probably can't go further than this. I mean, there have been definitely times where I've doubted myself. I mean, when I came back from England, I thought maybe I'm just not brave to go fast on the fast tracks because there was one in particular where I sucked at, it was called Thruxton. And it was this track where it was long, long sweeping corners, very fast. And I was, it was like my worst track. And I remember thinking, maybe I'm just not brave enough. 
And then uh, I get, came, you know, came back to America, and I remember getting to, to a point in Indy cars very early on. It might have even been my first few races. I think it was probably in Motegi, Japan, where I ended up finally winning, um, where I think I was like the first one that went flat out, flat out around um, the whole track because turns three and four is much tighter than one and two. And, um, you know, everybody noticed that. And I was like, I remember thinking with a couple of things that happened like that where I was like, you know what, turn one at, you know, turn one at mid-Ohio going nearly flat out and qualifying on the front row, like, okay, maybe I'm, maybe I'm actually pretty brave. And so, therefore, maybe it just takes having the right people behind you, people listening to you about what you need setup wise. And Did you practice a lot though to, to on those types of curves that you were nervous about? Um, I mean, I just, you know, knew that it was something I had to do a good job at for sure. You need to do a good job at the whole track, but it's more about, you know, having somebody that was listening to me about how the car felt so that they could change it. So it would suit Mm. me. And then that gave you more confidence that, okay, these people understand my fears. I haven't always just been, you know, I I can't always just trick myself into thinking that I'm that something is good before it's been proven to me sometimes. Well, what do you think but then separated there are other times you where the- you can. There are other times where you can, you know, fake it till you believe it. And that usually comes more on the side of like, I remember having media stuff to do and, you know, I was getting, you know, picked up at the bus to head to it. And, you know, me and Haley, who's worked with me for 10 years, she, we'd be like, kittens and rainbows today. Everybody's happy. It's going to be a great day. And it's because we were dreading going to the next three interviews we had to go do. But sure enough, Within 10 minutes, everybody's laughing, and I'm like, you know, it's actually a pretty good day. So you can fake it till you believe it in some ways. So I, I was listening to you on the Joe Rogan podcast, and you mentioned uh, you were reading The Holographic Universe yeah, by Michael Tavis. I still Tavik. am, by the way. It's That's a really okay. heavy book. I, I still am as well. So, oh, really? Are you reading that too? So, yeah. So Isn't it mind-blowing? So tell me about it. Like, what's your, what's your interest in that? He basically views well, I'm the just brain kind of and really the world as a Well, I'm curious about the fabric of our reality. Yeah, because there's no nobody knows, right? I know. Ninety-seven nobody percent knows. of the universe is dark energy. No, dark nobody, matter. What's dark matter? Yeah, nobody I had has any this clue. Epiphany the other day, I was like, "Is dark matter consciousness?" Like, I mean, what? Because we don't even understand it anyway, right? Is there some kind of like, is that like life force energy out there, and we don't understand it because we sure sure don't understand it on Earth as humans, right? And then there's then there's the idea that let's say we were technologically sophisticated enough to make. A virtual reality mm-hmm. that was also that when we made that virtual reality sophisticated enough to make a virtual reality within that, mm-hmm. like people, Which, can, then, yes. then it's probably the case. The odds are that well, there like, are that's what Elon minus. Musk said, right? Yeah. Are you like, is that what you saw? Like, or uh, these are probably your thoughts too. But um, I mean, I'm, I believe in the collective consciousness, and you know, I'm sure there's, you know, it's really ironic sometimes, right? How some people are having the same thoughts and ideas at separate separate places without any connection to each other. Um, but yeah, that's what Elon Musk said. If you if you look at like AI, or if you look at um, uh, if you look at virtual reality as it is right now and you have any level of trajectory moving forward, any any increasing level of trajectory, it is inevitable that you won't be able to tell the difference between reality and virtual reality. And then, of course, he went on to say, so what makes you think that we're not living in a virtual reality right now? Right, and then the metaphysics of that are, is that uh, so we're all kind of made out of the same one, ones and zeros then. So, how, yep. so where's the disconnection between one character in a virtual reality and the other, we're just sort of programmed to think that there's no connection, but uh, I think just, everything could be connected. I believe it's just consciousness. Come from, like, that's what source is. is and so so how do you use that in your daily life? Uh, I've learned this more over the last few years, but just believing something is really possible. And that's the difference is the difference between, like, I think I'm going to win today and, like, I feel it. Like, I know it. I see it. I Oh, like you have to feel it deep in your body and just know it. Kind of like my, it's like, I called it blind faith when I was a kid, but, um, you know, coming back from England at 16, at 19 years old, having no job and being without a ride for two years, but still believing I was going to make it. I was going to be an IndyCar driver. I was going to make it to the top levels of motorsports. But at that point in time, why the hell did I believe that? I and mean, what, I had no ride. I'm, you know, no sponsor, no interest. But you pushed but forward But I somehow. believed it. I had so much faith and belief that it was going to happen for me that it did. And so, but you didn't try, you didn't enter the Indy 500 the next day. You have to incrementally 
kind of get towards those long-term goals? So like, what was the very first thing you did to kind of push you within the next step? Um, I would just, I mean, I would go to the racetrack and just keep walking around and keep talking to people. And um, I remember the turning point with making, with finally taking the next step when I came back to America after England. And I went to, it was, it was, uh, it was the Milwaukee Mile race for Champ Car. Um, and uh, my dad was like, and it was only a mile, or it was only an hour from the house. Milwaukee was only a mile from where we lived. I'm sorry, Milwaukee was only an hour from where we lived. And so he's like, we, you know, we should go to the track. I'm like, Dad, I'm sick of walking around. I'm sick of pounding the pavement. I'm sick of, you know, having no one interested in me. He's like, let's just go for one hour. So ironically, just before this trip, I had a phone call with someone random that I actually never spoke to again after this phone call. Like, this is like some mythical conversation um, where he said, I am told I have a full sponsorship for you if you, if there's a letter of intent that says you're going to race for Bobby Ray Hall and Formula Atlantic. And I was like, okay. And anyway, so then we go up to Milwaukee and I see Bobby and I was like, hey, so, and I told him that and he goes, okay. And two weeks later, we signed the letter of intent and I never talked to that guy again and there was never a sponsor and it all just happened. And so now with, with the entrepreneurship and then we'll start to, I want to I wanna kind of summarize what all the things you're working on, but with entrepreneurship, do you feel it's the same thing? Like you have kind of this strong belief that, okay, this athletic wear, you know, I feel it. It's the it's the best, and so you now you're pushing forward in every direction to kind of get the word out there. Mm-hmm. Same thing with the wine. Mm-hmm. Same mm-hmm. thing with your mm-hmm. speaking mm-hmm. gigs. Plus mm-hmm. your 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 voice of empowerment towards women and entrepreneurship and and so on. Well, let See, me mention one more thing with all of these different companies and including racing. Racing wasn't to like. It wasn't to be famous. It wasn't to make money. It wasn't to, it was to, you know, it was to win because that's the hardest thing to do. And I really want to do it. And I want to put in the hard work. And it was to make it to the top level because I just, I wanted to make it all the way. And I loved it. And I was passionate about it. Just like, so my motivating force was not shallow, right? It wasn't short-sighted. Because if you, you know, if I really want to make some money, I could have sold my vineyard already. People have asked. And it's, you know, it's not for sale. Um, so if making money was my only goal, then I feel like it's not a very long-term goal. So with the wine, with the clothing line, with the book, there's all these other perspectives that I'm interested in it, not really just making money. Because I trust and know that if it's successful, it's going to make money. Danica, this has been so great. <laughs> you're, 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 Again, the only race car driver I would ever know the name of. <laughs> I'm very flattered, and, and I'm so proud of you for taking a course on driving. Yeah, I t- I did. I was, uh, but I was. I really was scared. I know doing you were it. horrible, like, but it's okay. Everybody starts somewhere. Yeah, and it wasn't. It wasn't a passion for me. The things that I am yeah. passionate about, I do figure out what the next step is. One last. Well, that's question. why you've written twenty books, right? There you go. So passion one one last question. Do you think so? So you retired from the racing. You're 36. Do you think at any age someone could say, you know what, I'm passionate about X and they can start moving forward and create, you know, magic success? Do I believe that that's yeah. possible? Absolutely. Because you're I doing do. it now with all I your, do. like who would have thought you would have gone from race car driving to a vineyard, to yeah. a clothing line, to books? I think that your true passions in life are... They come off so well, it resonates with people. People can tell when you're really into something and when you're not. When you're educated, when you're passionate, when you light up about it. It's that metaphysical energy that happens when you love something and people are like, wow, like look at you just light up when you talk about that. Right, it you creates know? more energy, right? Yes, more energy, higher vibration. And so when you're doing stuff that creates that, you are attracting like things of that high vibration, positive energy. And it and it's um it's like a magnet, you know, people are attracted to that kind of energy. So um all I can say is the most important thing is that you're doing things that truly bring you joy. And then I will I can trust and believe that everything else will be will take care of itself. So final, final question. <laughs> how do you know how if someone's 36, 40, 45, 50, they're they're thinking of switching careers, they did the whole college yep. accountant, whatever about how do they find, how do they begin the first step of finding what they're passionate about? I think one of the most telling things, and it's just like a simple little trick, but um, they'll give you two. One is what do you take pictures of? 
Like if you look on your phone and see what you take pictures of, a lot of times it has a pretty good indication of what you're interested in. Um, and then really think hard. And this is a little bit harder, but if you were to think about what you would do if you could do anything for a day, like just design your perfect day of the things that you would want to do, um, you know, like in, injecting like the, the hobbies that you like, you know, what would you do? Would you, um, you know, would you plant a garden? Would you cook? Would you paint? Would you... Um, um, you know, build something, would you, what would you, you know, what would you be doing like extracurricular for yourself? So that's why there's such value in spending time alone from, from time to time. I know it's hard and I know it's even harder when we have phones all around us. We don't even have to go to the bathroom by ourselves anymore. Um, but, um, but spending time by yourself really forces you to go, what do I want to do? And that's where I developed all the hobbies over the last five or six years of like painting and sewing and, um, um, fitness and um, gardening and cooking and, you know, very artsy stuff because I'm like, I had time by myself and I'm like, what am I going to do? So I just did whatever the heck I wanted to do. And that's very insightful into some of the stuff that you should maybe look into um, as passion projects. So Danica Patrick, race car driver, superstar, all you won all sorts of races of every sort. You also have Somnium. If I wanted to buy this bottle of wine, where would I go buy it? Um, online um, at somniumwine.com. And how um, much would this bottle cost? Uh, the full uh, regular size bottles are one eighty five, dollars um, And we're releasing the uh, half bottles um, in November 23rd. Uh, and those will be ninety five. dollars um, And then in the spring, we'll launch our Sauvignon Blanc and the Rosé. How about I about just buy flask? Can I buy flasks of your wine? You should sell that. That would be kind of cool, like a t- like a low end price point. Yeah, but with the flask it's, style. You know, corks are these magical natural ingredient that breathes the perfect amount to keep the wine just as it is. I'm not sure a flask would work. Uh, okay, and then <laughs> Warrior, the clothing line. Where do I find that? Uh, that is online as well. Right now, I'm kind of doing a little bit of an overhaul with it. So um, it's not available right now. And everything that we had with HSN is sold out. So you're going to have to wait on that one. And your book? Uh, Pretty intense. Is, yeah, is you on can Amazon. go on anywhere that they sell books, you can get the book. Yep. And what else? What else you want to talk What's- Gosh, I don't know. I mean, I think we covered a lot of it. I people ask when people ask me, they're like, "What else are you work in?" I'm like, "What else can I work on?" Jeez, I don't have enough time. Well, <laughs> vacations, thank holidays. Thank you for spending the time <laughs> on this podcast. I yeah, hope, thank you. Uh, you enjoyed it and enjoy. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.